Hello and welcome to Scott Dance USA's World Champion Dancers and Teachers interview series. I'm Emma Schiff. The Professional Development Committee at Scott Dance USA wants to help the Highland dancing world stay motivated during these challenging times. That's why we're talking to the best of the best, world champion dancers and their teachers. We'll learn about how they achieved what they did, plus their advice for dancers and teachers struggling during quarantine. We hope these videos can bring you inspiration. Enjoy. Today, I'm talking to four-time world champion Tony Cargo and his mom, well-respected dance teacher and judge, Linda Napier. Thank you both for being here. You guys are a rare example of a success story of a parent-child teacher relationship. You know, most parents that I know that start teaching their kid last about a month, <laughs> and then they take them to <laughs> someone else. <laughs> so, Linda, how did that work? How, was, like, was it difficult for you guys <laughs> To balance that relationship? And not initially, and not for a lot of years, I think up to about age 17, Tony. Well, when, when we had our challenges. Um, yeah, prob probably. Yes. So, Tony, was it challenging for you to see mum as <laughs> mum and teacher? No, I, I don't really think so because it was just the norm. You'd do your class, you'd go home, you'd, I, I'd, I'd see it as a, as a, many people wouldn't see it as a benefit, but looking back, I see it as a benefit because you had your teacher able to actually work with you at home because there's a lot of kids that don't go home and work with their parents mm -hmm. as much as they maybe should. So it was definitely a benefit. Linda, let's talk a bit about your teaching style. How did you work on technique? I guess I get Everybody knows I'm a fling person. <laughs> I get stuck on the fling. So um, yeah, we would. I think. I think in Scotland, technique is. Um, I mean, it's important everywhere. But our dancers dance on, you know, down on floors, not on platforms very often. So you know, our dancers are so close up to the judges' table that it's technique, 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 and everything has to be. You know, you, it's not like you're miles away and you can't tell a half point from a ball or a half point from a toe. You know, it's really, really obvious what part of the foot you're on all the time. I guess when the kids start in primary, you know, it's paddy bars, paddy ran, high cuts, flinging swords. So if they get the basics of all these things right, or they do their pre bronze for their medal test, have done string points, have done high cuts. Um, yeah, I guess I'm very much in. It has to be in the right place at the right time and. They don't, they don't get to do, you know, something wrong re, re, just to get through a dance and learn a new step, learn a new step. I would say that my dancers, when they're seeing beginners or novice, they don't really have a lot of choice of what steps they can do because they're trying to perfect the steps they got originally. Do you have any pet peeves? Well, I would say I'm, I'm a turnout person, so um, well, I don't know about pet peeves, but yeah, turnout would be my main thing. I would stress in the class and be a pet peeve. Yeah, dancers that dance off time. Tony, as a dancer, how did you work on fixing corrections? And also, what did you do for stamina? Oh, um, so for fixing cor corrections, it was just a lot of uh, repetition. And really, with, within that repetition, you had to keep on doing it until it was more permanent and not just doing it until it was fixed once, like it had to be done over and over again. Um, with regard to stamina, I think the only way to really get your stamina up for dancing is to get your full dances through to the music. Um, and, and even then doing it to slightly different tempos if possible was, is, is, a good, is a good way of um, building up your stamina because sometimes you can get too used to the same, same uh, Piper, and um, so it's it's good to good to definitely do it to slightly different tempos. I definitely agree about the doing full dances. Was that something you guys did more in practice and in lessons? You would work on technique and fixing corrections, or Linda, did you have dancers do all their dances through in lessons? No, I would say in a lesson we would maybe do two full dances. Um. 
at home we at home we didn't really do school dances. We didn't do great lengthy practices. It would be um people laugh at this, but when the adverts come on in the television, I would say, Right, Tony, come on, let's do let's do whatever was your correction. And the adverts went off, you would sit and watch his programme again and then the next set of adverts, come on, let's let's practice this again. So it was like a lot of it was short bursts of of practice and things. Um, I would say, you know, a bit about the stamina part. When Tony was up to about age eight, nine, he was very turned out, very technical, but quite stuck to the ground. No elevation whatsoever. So when he, I then thought, well, you know, you're going away into the, you'll soon be going into the tens at eleven. Sometimes we didn't have a lot of single age groups then, so it could either be a ten and under championship or an eleven and under. So the hop had to had to come at some point, so I had to start working on the hop and everything everything fell apart for quite a while, but I just persevered and people used to look as if say, What on earth is he doing? At age nine I decided this, you know, you have to start have to start dancing like a ten year old now. So we worked an awful lot on changing how he hopped and I think that's carried through to all all my dancers when they get to about that nine years nine year old i try to get them a little bit a little bit stronger and it's quite hard in this country because the kids have competitions most weekends there's not there's not a time of the year when we really have a break to break things down so it has to has to go hand in hand we're going to a competition on saturday as well you know so it falls apart it falls apart but you have to just persevere till it's improved do you think that's beneficial? Because here it's very different, you know, especially our younger dancers. If you're not traveling, you might have six competitions in a whole year. Do you think it's beneficial for kids there to have those competitions frequently, which can be very motivating, but you don't have a lot of time in between to really fix things? I think it's, I think it is very good, but it can also become that's what you do every Saturday. That's what you do every Sunday. You don't have you don't, a lot of kids don't have other hobbies. Dancers here don't do full dances really unless it's a championship. And at the Highland Games, we do an awful lot of bling sheen trues, jig and hornpipe. So our dancers are not really doing a sword dance in a reel all oh. summer, which I found, well, I found that a problem. You know, you, you were only doing a swords, maybe you didn't do a swords at a competition in june you maybe didn't do a swords in july unless you traveled abroad to a championship because they didn't have championships in july here so there was an awful lot of fling sheen through jig and hornpipe at our highland games but the, but the rest of the year the kids were doing with, with tony dance i think it was 10 dances eight, wow. eight or ten dances in a day yeah you didn't just go and do four you, you know you do the whole lot tony was there a difference for you in how you went into a competition if it was a highland games versus if it were a championship? I think maybe men mentally, um, so just because I enjoyed competing, um, when you throw the word championship in front of it, you feel like you need to push yourself harder. Um, but that, that being said, also depend on in the group. I think my mum would maybe agree that if the group was more challenging, I would push myself harder, um, not necessarily meaning to, but yeah. You were successful at Cowell very early on. You came fifth when you were 12, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So was there a specific moment, Linda, that you realized Tony had a, you know, was not just good for games and championships, but had a real shot at doing well at Cowell that young? No, not really. I always just thought Cowell was another level and, you know, it didn't really matter how many championships you'd won that year, that when you went to Cowell, it was another level that we maybe didn't know anything about that level. Um, so we always went, we always just went to Cowell um, hoping to do as well as you could, but I never, ever, I never, ever thought Tony could win the Worlds. Um, we used to go to competition or championships and I would be the first to go, oh my goodness, look who's in your group today. Oh my goodness. He never went to places. I guess I never built Tony up to be confident. It was always respect the people that's in your group. Um, you, always had a really, you always had a really tough, tough group here. And then when we went 
to over to Canada. Um, you had different competitors there who were excellent dancers. So we knew, I guess we used to go to Canada every year because we wanted to see the competition from Canada. I don't think we ever, I don't think we ever went to Cowell expecting, expecting to uh, do well. Um, and even when, when Tony, we spoke about this earlier, when Tony won the Worlds, I actually didn't think he'd won. Um, somebody had a, I think somebody had a first equal in the fling with him. And in my head, some other person had 88 points and that just threw me. And people are saying, of course he's won. He's got this first, that first, whatever he had. I'm going, no, no, somebody's got 88 points in the fling. And it took about four other teachers round about me to convince me that he'd won the Worlds. I still didn't believe he'd won. Even when wow. his number called out, I didn't really believe it. Tony, what was that moment like for you? Uh, well, win, winning the Worlds is, winning any championship is special, but to, to uh, as you know, to win the Worlds, it's... Uh, you don't really realize it until the drive home the next day. It doesn't, I, I don't really think it truly sank in until you'd be on, on your way home. Um, so the first one was very, very special. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a good drive home for sure. <laughs> Did you feel any added pressure after you won your first Worlds the years later competing? Um, I've, because we're in a competitive sport, then usually once you have been fortunate enough to win a world championship, then people see you as being here and they then want to beat you. So um, there, have, there have been times where I've felt pressure and, and when you have gone on and won, say, a different championship, it's been more of a relief to win. Um, but yeah, the, I, know, I, I was quite driven, so I did, did enjoy continuing to work hard to try, try and win more often. Um, but yeah, there was definite, definitely pressure um, after winning the Worlds, for sure. Were nerves ever an issue for you? Um, I don't think so. I, I don't recall. Really. I was. <laughs> I, basically, my mom would spend her time at championships stressing out because <laughs> she didn't know what Tony she was going to get for the fling. Oh. Uh, I think, what? I think the only time I'd really get nervous yeah. would usually be when I'd screw up a dance or jump on my sword or because then it's like, okay, I can't, can't make another mistake now. That would be when I'd have to really get my act together, so. You, you had an awful lot of championships where you would do three dances right and one wrong. So <laughs> it was very nerve wracking because you didn't know, you didn't know what you were going to get. And I couldn't sit and enjoy the dancing so much because you didn't know if you was going to stop. And that was, that was no matter what age he was, he would do three right and if he's, if he pointed to second position, it was like a quarter of an inch out of where he thought second should be stopped because he'd made a mistake. To him, that was a mistake. Um, I would say the Commonwealth Championship was probably the worst one for me, where it was the alternative um, first step in the Sheen Trues. And I watched him shuffle, 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 Paddy Bar all the way up the line. Then he got on the floor to dance and did two circles. Just came from just came from nowhere, um, so you didn't know what you you didn't ever know what what was going to happen. I, I'll step in about that though. That was because <laughs> on the first set when the, the first set of dancers, um, I stupidly didn't go into the paddy bars when I was going through it in my head. So then I spent the whole time thinking about not screwing up, and then I went up and I. So I guess that would have been the time that I was nervous because mm. I was with it in my head. What was the funniest competition memory you have? Funniest competition memory? Ooh. Like funny now or funny at the time? Maybe <laughs> funny now. <laughs> um, 
pretty shoot. Did I not drop my Balmoral in a puddle at Cowell one time? In the yeah, you, I think I think I think you did, and you forgot you forgot your shillelagh at Highland Games, and I went and got a branch off a tree and tried to make it into a shillelagh just so that you could go up and do the jig. Yeah. Um, he once went to he, he once did a hill race um, at the Highland Games because I'd always promised he could do the hill race when it came on. But his full intentions, I think, of doing the hills race was to miss the jig because he didn't like the jig. Well, he didn't like the costume. Wow. But when he, he but he managed to get back just in time for me to get his jig out, put on and up for the jig. So it backfired on him a little bit. He still had to do the jig. But if he'd been just a little bit slower at the hill race, he would have got away with, with not having to do the jig. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about your practicing. Tony, what was the hardest thing for you to fix? Um... I would just say, well, looking back, it would be in my upper body. Um, and I don't know if that was something that was hard to fix or just something I didn't focus on enough. Um, just as Mama had alluded to earlier, we spent a lot of time in smaller halls dancing. So the focus was more on technique and you're closer up. So you wouldn't really notice until the summer when you maybe were on platforms that... I danced a bit hunched over for, for a while. So that would have been my, I would say my biggest weakness as a dancer would have been my hunched over body. How did you stay committed to practicing? Um, I think like any dancer who commits to practicing, it's about having a parent at home helping, helping with, with corrections. So Linda, did you always practice with Tony? Was every practice more like a lesson or was it more he would practice and if he needed you to come look at something, no, you would take no, a look. No, no, no. <laughs> if, if, if you asked Tony to practice, he probably would have gone up the stairs and just banged about with his foot on his bed to make out his practice. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't know. No, I always, I always, pra I always practice, practice with him, I think. Didn't, I don't think you did very much on your own, did you? Um, not as a young kid. I think I did it when oh. I was older. Yeah. But, because mm. when you're winning championships, you realise that you do have to, you do have to actually put time in, and work work for it. So, so yeah. Um. Linda, does your teaching style or the way you have your kids practice does that change throughout e the year? You know, different from December when there's not so much going on versus August when you have cowl coming up. It would it would have done with it would have done with. Tony, but I don't, I don't think so much. So I, I have got kids right now who are pre premiers, um, and it's just push, push, push to just try and fix things all the time. Um, but Tony and I spoke about this before that he used to always peak in May. We don't know why he was just always at his best in May. We have we have four champ. Well, at that time we had four championships in May, so we would have had two or three championships in April, sorry, March and April, then when it came to May, we would have one every week. So when it came to May, it would be like, oh my goodness, that's really good, that's really good. I went, oh no, how can you keep this, how can we keep this going till August? But we didn't. I quickly learned that just let it go in June. Um, there was no championships in June, so we didn't do very much in June and let it slip a bit, and then built it up again for going to Canada. Um, and then whatever happened in July happened and you had to deal with it for August. So, Tony, did you ever have any injuries that you had to deal with? I um, had a few injuries um, and I popped my groin at one point, but um, that wasn't too bad. I, when I was uh, 18, 19, I had really bad back problems. Um, so that, that, was, that was hard to over. That, that was pretty hard to overcome and really that that happened through overuse because I did a bit too much too, too much uh, different sports at school within a week and then had the championship and it was actually can't was it second championship of the year was it Bears then where um mm -hmm. up during the reverse points mm -hmm. yeah um so yeah that was it was a hard thing to overcome because when you go from practicing and competing and competing um, to then 
your only activity that your physio is recommending is walking and then wanting to compete again and re-injuring it, it was, it was quite, quite a difficult thing to overcome. How so, did you end up overcoming that? Time. Like it was just, yeah, it was just time. And it was just, it felt like it was a bit of a two year period before it really got fully, fully healed kind of thing. So it was, yeah, it was, it was definitely a challenging one and I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. Um, so yeah, it was, but it was a good experience to overcome and yeah. Did you ever get to a point during that two year period where you maybe thought that you wouldn't be able to go back to championships or that you didn't know if you wanted to even try to get back to that level again? So I guess full disclosure, I think the year after it, when it had healed, I had a, a lot of, I would say I would have had some mental issues and I wasn't in a happy place, which maybe led to me lashing out, etc. And um, I would say the mental health issues would have been worse than the back problems, but the back problems led to me not wanting to dance, not wanting to compete, not enjoying dancing anymore. And um, so... I think it was just taking a break was what ended up being most most important uh, for getting back into competing. But at the same time, um, by not being there mentally, that was when it really caused a divide divide between my mum and I because just I was maybe angry about how my back had been and then started lashing out and yeah, it, that that end. The back problem, I would say, is what led to problems later on. Um, but and yeah. you said that was when you were nineteen ish. Eighteen and nineteen. So yeah. you went on to win the worlds again after that. Yeah, yeah. Um, How, that must have been amazing to come back from all of that. Yeah, it, it, it was. Yeah, it was. It was def definitely very good, um, and it was something that I never. Never expected, never expected to do again. So, yeah. uh, the last thing I just want to touch on is obviously this is a very difficult time for not only dancers but a lot of teachers as well, struggling to find motivation and ways to keep their students motivated. We don't know when the next championships will be. Linda, is there anything you're doing with your students to keep them into Highland dancing <laughs> and wanting to practice? I think we're. I think quite a few of the teachers are here and now focusing on um, medal test work, um, learning the dancer steps they haven't done before. Like my premier dancers, I'm going through every step in the book, which I would never really have done that in a lesson because it would be a competition coming up. So the older ones are also doing their theory for say doing their associates or members or just trying to keep them busy with other things rather than the championship steps, although I keep coming back to the championship steps. Um, yeah, I think, I, I think lots of dancers who, if, if all they want to do is dance championships and that's their main focus, they're not really the ones who keep going with dancing all their life. So I try to, try to make, I, I'm not making a big thing, oh, you're missing a competition, oh, this would have been this championship today. Um, just trying to keep them dancing and I've not really, I've, I've actually thoroughly enjoyed doing Zoom lessons. I didn't think I would, but I really do quite enjoy it. I've not had many of the kids miss a lesson. There's been a couple of little meltdowns and a couple of tears through frustration at the other end of the screen when they don't understand what I'm saying. And my, hus my, my husband says he can hear me at the bottom of the street because I think, I think if I shout louder, they'll understand it better, but that's not the case. Um, yeah, so just not making a big deal about competitions. Um, and Tony, do you have any advice for the competitive dancers out there? Okay, so as a competitive dancer, I think now is a great time that if you're having difficulty correcting or, or you've not had the time to be able to break down a movement that uh, maybe needs to take a couple of steps backwards to get it better, now is the perfect time to readjust that technique. Mm -hmm. um, 
because you know it's not like, oh, we've got a championship next week, right? So you, you don't have to be on your game. Like you can literally take a couple of steps backward right now to, to correct your technique. So yeah. I absolutely I agree with. <laughs> you you set, set your list of what needs to be fixed and you work your way down it. Yep, I 100% agree with what both of you said. Thank you both so much for speaking with us today. Speaking Thank you. Thank you.